good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on whether you're listening to us from the other side of the ocean. Welcome to the first Experts Workshop of 2024 of the Participatory Group. As you know, it's the cooperation agreement between the City Council of Madrid and the National Distance Education University UNED in this series of workshops of experts we are going to talk about a topic related to public participation we try to make these series as varied as possible not only a case study to write down takeaways from i think that today's case study is very peculiar given the situation that latin america is living especially in ecuador we can take away important lessons. Architect Beatriz Elena Rave Herrera is here with us today. How are you? I'm very grateful to be here and I'm very excited to talk about my city. Every time I have the opportunity to talk about lessons learned, I'm talking about life lessons at the end of the day because they are the fruit of experience many professions and I'm very excited to be talking to you about these important life lessons. As you can see, Beatriz has a wonderful combination of sweetness, energy, strength. You might not know this but she's been a candidate to the City Council of Medellin. So she is charismatic and a great leader and at the same time what I like the most is the fact that she is also an academic. She is the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design of the Pontifical Bolivarian University. She has a very comprehensive profile and she's really interested in telling us about the peace process in Medellin. It's quarter past four. We would like for this presentation to last about 45 minutes. Beatriz, I know that you can perfectly moderate one of these sessions, but we will still be supporting you on the chat in case there are inquiries, doubts, questions, and at the same time, if you want us to interrupt you, and ask the questions on the spot, we can also do that to make the workshop more dynamic. We would like this session to last one and a half hours in total, approximately. We try to be on time as much as possible so that people who are attending the workshop know when it starts, when it finishes. That's all. I give you the floor. Thank you, Beatriz. Thank you, Marta. I am here to give you a little bit of context. I have had the privilege to hold several roles in Medellin. I've been in the civil service, in the private sector, in academia. As you were mentioning, I have been in politics and this has allowed me to understand the paradigm of each of these roles and to really read and get to know the city. When it comes to different issues, I have been working in Medellin for many years, participating in different exercises of plan drafting implementation of projects, etc., and monitoring, designing indicators, and recording lessons learned, takeaways to build capabilities and competences. So I'm going to try to compile everything that I have learned, but it's not easy. I'm therefore going to use slides to tie my speech. I will be talking to you about three specific moments. 
let me hide this tab here it is again I apologize for the technical issues what we can see is the slide about stage 3 yes but I don't know how to remove this tab up here can you not see a tab? I don't know how to remove it. We can see your slides perfectly on the whole screen. No tabs. OK. Great, then I will try to give you a little bit of the context of Medellin, dividing it in three stages. The first stage is called From Fear to Hope. As you know, Medellin was sadly famous as a city during the mid-late 80s to the mid-90s because it was a city riddled with violence derived from drug trafficking and for you to understand it better, there was territorial control Groups that were outcasts and carrying out unlawful activities took control of the peripheries of cities where there was no institutionalization, so the territory and the community there was completely excluded, making them the perfect victim for these organized criminal groups. These were dark times. I had to study architecture during the times of the curfew in the city. This curfew hadn't been imposed by the government, but the organized crime groups. These were very dark times. From this analysis, I've tried to... I've titled this first stage From Fear to Hope. Medellin has... seen many interventions and management plans but that was a real turning point the moment where we elected a government that apart from the participatory tradition would think about territories technically this government wanted to encourage participation to look at the Medellin territory very carefully. Medellin is located between valleys. It's metropolitan, it's urban, and the national government back then decided to create a council for Medellin and the metropolitan area. That was the first important Medellin project. As you know, it has got wonderful weather. It has very interesting and appealing traits as a city. But from then onwards, what really happened was that we started to build capabilities to understand our territory differently and to understand that exclusion had to be solved in a way or another. These instances of improvement for the metropolitan area because of the activities carried out with the stakeholders involved this was the start of institutional presence and territorial presence that really shaped conditions for the city why because culture became the axis of participation in a country and in a moment in time of of transition of our constitution to be more precise our constitution went from a representative to a participatory constitution. This violent episode in the city of Medellin was dominated by the organized criminal groups in the territory. This stage saw the arrival of new stakeholders reaching the outskirts that were most isolated to make two proposals that were very difficult for us back then, very challenging. To redefine public spaces and to boost dialogue. 
through culture, through art, these interventions have still a huge value today and that's why maybe Medellin is called the capital of urban art, dare I say. We learned how to use public spaces as well. We learned how to make them work for us. From fear to hope, that stage was crucial because of the new government that got to power and imposed highly technical bureaucracy. We saw this even in the architecture faculties. They started to analyze territories. Their goal was to distribute territory in an equitable manner and to call for institutionalization, closing the gaps that were making the isolated inhabitants the perfect victims for organized criminal groups. So, out of the whole exercise to promote dialogue in open spaces, to encourage dialogue in a different way, all of this started to configure, to articulate the second stage. The first stage was from fear to hope. The second stage, however, was more about the context. I need to make a disclaimer. I always like to start my stories by telling you how, how they end. I'm going to give you the context, the takeaways, the lessons learned, and then I'll go back to the details to explain the happy ending of this story, as I like to say. From the emergence of a response to a critical situation faced in the entire city, what makes Medellin famous is the Medellin model imposed in the last years. Recently, in city contests, Medellin has been awarded several prizes for being the most innovative city in the world because of their response to the complex situations that we were facing, including gaps, exclusion, isolated groups of society. Medellin was probably one of the most unequal cities in Latin America because of the limited territory the high concentration of wealth in few hands, and this city was the cradle of many innovations for the entire country, but we saw the coexistence of people who were at high risk of exclusion under the poverty line threshold, and this gap was the one that created the perfect breeding ground for violence, derived from drug trafficking and all the associated dynamics that have to do with territorial control by criminal groups. That made our youth go for opportunities that they couldn't find in the institutional framework. The Medellin model is a strategy. A strategy that we have presented when I say we, I'm referring to our politicians, technicians, teachers, researchers, and even our citizens. We have shared these dynamics and processes in different cities of the world, inspired by the way that Medellin was starting to be understood to attend to inequality. Back then, a collaborative project was, if you ask me, the main cornerstone of this road to leave fear behind. We have traditionally worked in a collaborative manner. In this city, we have carried out a project of cooperation between academia thinkers, and public and private sector stakeholders. This has allowed us to construct visions and plans and projects, and in a way, 
it is what articulates the innovative tradition that dates back many years in the case of territorial planning it is also the realm of cross-sectional partnerships that have made us very resilient in the third stage these factors are also strengthening us i'll tell you about that later our technical group elected for the first time mayors in a democratic way because of our constitutional transformation another turning point in our history we started to choose our mayors elect them democratically and we started to identify things like the index of human development for our territory and we solidified the city by identifying those places where living standards were lower the most important decision after this analysis was that of investing in our territory and in communities in an inversely or reversely proportional ratio to these uh, living standard indexes so we would invest more where conditions were more precarious not only were we going to invest in the territory but we made the important decision to intervene in these areas in a comprehensive manner this process bore its fruit and caught people's attention because these indexes changed very swiftly improving living standards indicators this normally takes decades for those who study development matters in in medellin it happened extremely fast after these comprehensive interventions in contrast to these first interventions we decided to use art and culture to encourage dialogue between the most excluded communities and thus we systematized the results of this project and we proposed a renewed way to intervene in territories it was no longer about isolated sporadic interventions with participatory exercises in the peripheries but a completely new model for a city coordinated with comprehensive interventions in critical areas this exercise was the fruit of thorough participation and dialogue between stakeholders had a very positive impact in the city that's what the medellin model is all about we went from a dark city famous sadly because of violence into a city that had closed inequality gaps and that was working in an increasingly coordinated manner and the comprehensive intervention built intersectional dialogues to structure a series of city plans and a city model that included several critical projects with structural interventions since i like to start by telling you the end of the story as i like to say but also with the aim to reflect during the next hour i wanted to mention that there's so much to learn for from our own work we saw with the medellin model how we could go from fear to hope we carried out urban innovations by restructuring the city model and by developing strategic projects that were all turning points for the vision that we had for the present and future of our city but also the strengths that we had identified at that point let me go back to this point i am talking about political instruments for projects and programs that took place in a comprehensive manner and that saw the convergence of all secretariats with 
comprehensive budget in order to carry out a very resilient transformation because it was supported by urban projects. Internationally, that's what they are called, comprehensive urban projects. Dealing with public spaces, social interventions, mobility, economic financial development, education too. Understanding that education is an activity that allows us to really transform our society and territory as a whole. The city has bet on building institutional capacities, but citizen capacities too. And this model has somehow entered a crisis nowadays because we were counting on institutionalization that did strengthen with the increased presence of institutions in the territory. But we've also seen in recent years a sort of precarization of our institutions. Or we are at least in a sort of limbo, I'd say, that has definitely taken its toll. The termination of these policies that once allowed that transition from fear to hope to happen, that made us a benchmark of a social urban city beyond the borders of the city and even the national borders. Today we are facing many challenges because city processes are very slow. So some of the best impact or the most tangible impact of this process of intervention in cities, that first transition, that first stage from fear to hope to becoming an international benchmark, we see the positive impacts now. Because obviously Medellin has become a very appealing city, as opposed to Cartagena. Cartagena is world heritage, and yet Medellin is not only the most touristy city in the country. We receive tourists and visitors, but also digital nomads who stay in Medellin for at least six days and up to long periods of time. We also see the critical effects of tourism and gentrification. We know that many Spanish cities are experiencing this same phenomenon, as well as other cities in the world. After the success of having shared the innovation, the urban innovation model, what happened was that we have so many challenges, so many questions to really understand how to harmonize all of these conflicts that we are undergoing today. Socially, territorially, financially, environmentally, we have the challenge to keep building technical and institutional capacities as well as our citizens' capabilities. And what I ask in different scenarios is let's not allow for participation to become a literary thing. Those are my lessons learned or takeaways. Now I'd like to go into the details of the challenge that academics face, as well as the public and private sector, even political platforms are facing the challenge of preparing new professionals to understand the Ibero-American context. That's why these workshops are so valuable, because we need that open, relevant, permanent dialogue. We need city schools, as they're called, and we need to carry out more projects, not only for a better understanding of cities, but because this planning activity that Medellin underwent for the development of projects but 
because we want to monitor, follow up, and be better prepared to make decisions. Just to give you the location, this is the Department of Antioquia in Colombia. I live in Medellin, the capital of the department. It's got a metropolitan area. Now I'd like to get into the details of the participatory exercise. I think that Medellin has achieved success and it has understood how important the role of participation is in the construction of cities. Collaborative work, dialogue for a long time in the city has been a success. We have successfully established a council between state, university and business that are in constant discussion. In recent years, we have seen gaps in the dialogue again. Thanks to the renewed government, we hope this partnership will shine again. Participation is a management approach to validate and legitimize projects and it's very important for the appropriation of our cities and for a more active community this is the result of a healthy city management and planning model from the first to the second stage we saw a tangible improvement we need to encourage competitiveness because Medellin was not an appealing city in the past. It became very visible in all international platforms. Suddenly we were very successful, but we were left with many questions to really understand our territory. We need to think about participation and planning for development and governance. We have permanently worked at different scales. We have a multi-scale planning exercise that we have divided our territory in for participation and we have used our technical and participatory strength. We have been really inspired for a long time particularly by Spanish pra practices, specifically those in the city of Madrid. We have a permanent planning and understanding and analysis of the territory at different levels and scales, but this planning exercise is always supported by all sectors and the population as a whole and different institutions plus academia. Academia is a platform for dialogue. It has been a repetitive activity divided in many strategic lines of work and since then we have been in permanent assessment of this exercise. For the urban participation benchmark we carried out in an architecture and development process that was extremely valuable. Let me give you an example. This was the structural axis of the city model and that of the metropolitan area too. We have used tenders to encourage participation of many actors. These have been successfully implemented. Let me give you an example of a successful project. One of the main foundations of the territorial occupation model and one of the cornerstone or flagship projects. It was a project developed through tenders in the city in recent years. Let me speed up because I've been talking for half an hour. I'd like to finish by telling you how this model extends to other territories in the Department of Antioquia. It is worth noting that all of these tenders and this strategy from intersectorial public dialogue to repetitive planning 
and the development of strategic projects has always been based on imagery with the participation of citizens this has been the pillar and the main platform and means of these projects i wanted to mention parque del rio parque del rio is a project that was present in all urban participation projects for three decades it's one of our most successful and most attractive city projects because it meant that our river was transformed because it used to represent the frontier that divided our city into and now it's our biggest multimodal surface we built spaces around the river surrounding the river which is very symbolic public spaces have been the platform for participatory exercises and in order to recover our identity and participatory tradition this is fundamental if we want to build citizenship it is very important particularly after the first stage where violence was so present before citizens couldn't really get to certain territories in the outskirts these spaces have become intervention areas for instance here you can see a bridge you might have seen that this is one of the first coordination projects we live in a valley and we wanted to manage our territory over the land grooves this has allowed us to recover environmental pillars of our valley but also to coordinate dialogues institutional interventions have also become extremely important in the structural axis of the city because we have turned them into public buildings part of the success of the medellin model is this project that won the linkwanyu award these institutional projects have ended up becoming spaces for integration and participation as well as the periphery territories even the environmental outskirts are no longer vetoed areas instead they are now spaces for participation and co-creation now that we are truly the owners of our own spaces this is particularly relevant and that's all for the first half an hour of my presentation i've basically told you how we went from fear to hope and how we created the medellin model i think that these workshops have the aim as marta was saying to become a source of reflection so that we can write down lessons learned that are very difficult to compile and collect briefly this model was replicated at different scales in different cities i first worked in medellin in the municipality of medellin today called the district of medellin and later i worked at department level this is a much broader territory with 125 municipalities and yet we use the same model that worked so well with medellin aimed at closing social inequality and gaps not only in the territory but in our societies other territories that were also overcome with violence and criminal groups and illegal activities were present in antioquia and also outside of the department a better understanding of population dynamics and territorial dynamics led us to propose 
a collective and joint solution for territories. These lessons learned, based on our work in Medellin, were replicated in other spaces. We have historically and recently carried out multi-sectorial roundtables with multiple stakeholders in order to develop cornerstone flagship projects for populations located in the outskirts and where institutionalization is not that present. They simply cannot meet the demands of these populations so far. These populations thus become at-risk populations because of this existing gap. One of the most important takeaways is the joint collaborative work between different institutions in order to hold and carry out projects and to work on images for the development of projects. As you can see here, we were present in Vigía del Fuerte, one of the five poorest municipalities in Latin America. We carried out at municipal level, we carried out a comprehensive exercise after another, we need strategic planning frameworks developed by government so that we can use our budgets better and smarter and so that we can really plan but also create infrastructures for mobility, equipment, public spaces, education, venues, facilities. That's precisely what we did in Vigía del Fuerte. I also, we also wanted to create an architecture through comprehensive interventions to reach territories more successfully or more easily. What we learned in comprehensive activities in Medellin was how to develop different methodologies depending on the scale of intervention. I'd like to share one of the most extreme cases. Medellin is robust institutionally. It counts on a much larger budget than other towns. But this methodology was replicated in more extreme territories. And I think that that is one of the biggest feats of this team. A team formed by stakeholders. We love to share these projects. This is the conceptual result of these interventions. We coordinated financial, social and infrastructure tasks. We coordinated stakeholders to cooperate, to work together with the citizens. And that's how this exercise became a success at different scales. I am not going to dwell on the details. This is not only a whole municipality. We also carried out an interesting governance activity, creating images to understand and manage the expectations of our community. We analyzed the territory, the population, the whole demographic structure and their needs, and we also collected the possibilities put forward by different bodies. They had expectations to allocate money throughout the term, so we articulated a plan for it to be more impactful for the community and definitely to lead to an increase in quality. These interventions are also stemming from the initial Medellin model. We analyze the precariousness of a particular neighborhood, the one on the screen. And we carried out a project that entailed co-creation and participation because when communities really see the results of investment of public interventions, 
they really want to participate. So this exercise got the whole participate the whole community to participate. And they decided to double the budget allocated by the government in order to keep intervening in these areas. And so that they could work on gardens and grants for children. What I want to convey with this is that we have worked on different intervention scales. And there is a huge diversity of projects that we were able to carry out from then onwards. The most participatory activity was that of the educational parks. We created library parks in Medellin, the España Library of, of Medellin, and this same thing happened in each of the most isolated and poorest municipalities of Antioquia. We invited each and every one of these communities to build a project reflecting the vision for the future and the demands that they wanted to fulfill. We put this project out to tender. Rafael Muneo was involved. We saw the participation of many stakeholders and we received the first award of architecture because this architecture improved resilience. This was one of the five poorest municipalities in Latin America. I'm talking about Vigia del Fuerte, and yet we bet on this project strongly and it successfully took place. Same thing happened with different projects of the territory and I think that this exercise is the result of what we learned through participatory planning and participatory exercises related to specific projects in the territory. Those were lessons learned from Medellin. We were able to replicate them in the rest of the Antioquia department. And it was also collected in management models for foreign projects. And projects for after natural catastrophes. In the Salgar municipality, there was an avalanche, sadly, that led to severe flooding and almost 100 families lost their houses and lives. That's why we decided to build images as an exercise, because we wanted to intervene collectively in the whole, in the entirety of the municipality with this model. This led to the reconstruction of the village based on their dreams, the dreams of their community as to what they wanted from their new habitat. There we learned a very valuable lesson, moving from tragedy to hope through a participatory exercise, from planning to implementation, from plan to project. With that comprehensive view of the territory, that is so urgent at this point because we want to recover the, or to catch up with the environmental fight beyond all the theory that is reflected in, in territories with a very transformed habitat. It has been transformed by participatory planning and execution exercises. With this list of projects of different scales and areas, I'd like to conclude my presentation so that we can talk together and expand on certain topics that might be most of interest to you. What do you think, Marta? Thank you, Beatriz. Thank you very much for sticking to time since you had to explain a very dense and complex exercise. Thank you for that ability you've got to synthesize information. I haven't stopped taking notes for a second.
I'm going to use my privilege as a moderator to ask you a couple of questions. The rest of the workshop will follow naturally with the intervention of different attendees. First of all, I'd like to mention the attempt. I mean, I've just been in Colombia with you, but it's true that it's very difficult to imagine these places and what these territories were like before that stage of fear and violence that you were describing. We've seen it on TV shows and films, but we haven't experienced it firsthand. I think it's fascinating how we try to reconstruct societies with a human and spatial vision, opening humans up to new spaces so that they can reconceive their relationship to space. That is the biggest feat. The most important challenge, I imagine, is that first time when you, when you open the doors to a society that was so isolated by, back then, would you like to get into the resistance, the initial skepticism that you faced by society, that resistance to start participating. I imagine that society back then was very fearful in Medellin and there was a huge distrust of public administrations. You've talked us through a very natural shift, but from the outside I'm thinking about certain similar parts of Spain where there's been a lot of terrorism. And yes, now we can have a walk around certain neighborhoods that were simply dangerous. 20 years ago, it was unthinkable to be there so calmly. Because I'm an urban planner, I'd also like to ask you about the funding of the comprehensive interventions. You caught my attention when you mentioned that in certain cases at the end when you were giving the list of examples you were talking about how neighbours when seeing the tangible results of the investments decided to participate as well. How can we carry out urban regeneration when the legal and social problem is the same one. And I apologize for abusing the time I, I've got. I wanted to break the ice, that's all. Thank you again for your capacity to summarize. I don't know if other Spanish people feel the same way as I do, but in general, Spanish people love to hear the Colombian accent. There are some questions on the chat. Thank you, Beatriz. Thank you, Marta. Got a certain bias as an architect. So because I see that the questions I'm receiving have more to do with participatory exercises, I'm going to try to get into the topics that I eliminated from my presentation. Things like the questions that Borja is asking, like the number of attendees, number of stages. I analyzed all participatory exercises in Medellin from the change of our constitution, and I wanted to tell you about my findings. Again, I apologize for my bias as an architect. For me, the most important thing has been coming through succeeding after this stage of violence that I lived. Participation is key. Participation was a huge step and yet the biggest leap was the moment when Medellin derived concrete projects from these discussions. This led to a social and territorial fundamental transformation through urban planning and architecture as tools. These are not results, they are tools. The result is not an effective transformation of the territory. I mean, 
achieving inclusion, inclusive territories, inclusive spaces, that is the result, resignifying public spaces in a city where, as you were saying, I mean, I grew up in fear. I was very scared growing up. My generation is still fearful. I have a son who's around 26 years old, and he was 11 or 12 years old when we traveled and I just couldn't get myself to separate from him and be away from him. I always thought that something terrible would happen to him, that he would be mugged or kidnapped. In other cities like Buenos Aires, nothing was happening back then. Nothing dangerous. So people would tell me, why are you so protective? And yet, I was very scared because of the fact that I grew up in Medellin in the 80s. We try not to mention this stage, but part of our healing as a society comes from these forms of expression. As a kid, I simply would never go out to the street. We always stayed indoors. Maybe in the home of a classmate, because going out would mean risking our lives. The police could be easily bribed. One of the most critical moments was when the bomb started to explode. A bomb was even planted in a bullfighting ring, as well as in a park and two malls. We were living in a state of panic. Back then there were no cell phones. We only had landlines. So we reached a point where the impact of bombs became a part of our landscape. I was no longer even scared. We got to a point where we just learned to live in fear and uncertainty. In order to answer the couple of questions on the chat, I'd say yes, there was a succession of participatory planning exercises with different traits. And there's even a book that I'd like to share with you and that I would like to show you here very quickly. I'll try to share my screen again. Can you see my screen? Oh, here it is. I'd like to share something with you. Let me choose my screen. If you look at my screen, at this point, I'm being asked on the chat about participatory exercises. I'm sorry for having moved through the slides so fast. From 1999 onwards, there were many steps taken. I have selected four, reflecting those who participated, how they did, the results deriving from each of these plans, I've just chosen different plans. The first of which was merely strategic. It was to build the vision for Antioquia. It was called 21st Century Antioquia Vision. I participated last year. I participated in the Antioquia Vision for 2040 and 2050 then again. I love participation processes, but this one back then had a very specific trait. It was one of those first exercises that, in the framework of a critical, violent era, it grounded us all. A very beautiful sentence that I like to repeat is, We've reached a new low, so we have no other option but to sit down, look at each other in the eyes and talk. This means reaching the most impacted areas, but also citizens were so wounded, impacted by violence, traumatized. We had to sit down and think about the fact that we had reached a new low and we wanted to 
rebuild our future by identifying the pain, the gaps. This was the first exercise in 1995. and rebuild our future, identifying gaps and identifying that pain. This first exercise, carried out in 1995, was Medellin and Alternatives for the Future. Back then it was my first semester studying architecture. I was a student representative, so I could participate. It was critical because it was a point of saying, look, this problem just has to be solved and it has to happen jointly, together. Are we not even willing to cooperate to solve our issues? Is It was a collective vision for the future with the participation of all sectors of the public and private sectors, academia too. It was beautiful because we learned as well. We learned how to debate, discuss. When there are people from other countries coming to Medellin, I mean Medellin still receives at least seven international groups coming to visit the city every now and then. They want to hear the recipe of our success and also what we've done really badly. We can learn a lot from our worst practices. This was the first time where we learned how to debate, discuss and talk to one another and how to build a vision jointly. We said, okay, Medellin is going to be the best corner of the Americas. It's going to be healthy. It's going to be a harmonious, eco-friendly, competitive, environmentally friendly city. But then we created a strategic plan for Medellin and the metropolitan area. I'd like to show you the book. Maybe I can share it on the screen. This was a beautiful next step because we moved from vision to projects. I want to share this book with Marta. In the book you can read about who participated, the number of attendees. First of all, I think that the most beautiful part was the way in which each plan just led to the next one, led to the next participatory process. So many others followed, like the Medellin Lab, and one of the most recent ones was the Metropolitan Housing Strategic Plan, another participatory project after the strategic plan, which was no longer a vision, but classified as a project. It was very important because we wanted to become the best corner of the Americas. This filled us with hope in a moment of fear and darkness. We saw the light through projects like this, like the ones with music bands, with all the children in different areas building a network of music bands. That's a very specific example. The Zone Development Plan 2, the Bank for Opportunities giving loans to entrepreneurs to encourage entrepreneurial projects like that of Women with Talent, a project involving women that had always been instruments and victims of war. This was groundbreaking to talk about the talents of women. Isn't this moving? This is a very emotional project for me. It's very close to my heart. This was the second stage of projects. Then we had the Antioquia Planea Plan, a third stage with territorial occupation models being put forward and the territorial transformation happened in 1997. We had never incorporated the vision of instruments for land management. Marta, of course, you invited me here to talk about the behind the scenes. We had to plan to manage the territory and then 
I selected another case study, a project to identify the strategic vocation of the city. Twenty years ago, we carried out a specific exercise, the result of which was the decision of what the identity of the city was. Back then, we decided the, that the identity of our city was innovation, and many found it absurd. They said, what do you mean the city is innovative? If people are even recommended not to even set their foot here, if there's so much violence, we are very regionalistic, so we've always had a sense of identity, but it wasn't linked to innovation. We needed a discourse of hope. These participatory activities are just three examples of a long list of programs to build strategic plans and visions for different sectors, innovations, etc. We've never stopped planning because planning exercises that are participatory have become the platform to coordinate efforts, dialogue and strategic matters on strategic matters for a more cohesive society. A society with gaps and divisions can only be healed through a structural participation exercise at different scales. The superpower of Medellin is as follows. So, we lived three stages, from fear to hope, the Medellin model, and the aftermath of our success. That living happily ever after moment. But now, again, it's urgent that we go back to discussions. This is a never-ending activity. Once you finish a plan, you need to be ready to go to resume the next one to take that next step. The superpower of Medellin is that we have always counted on a company called Public Services of Medellin with the monopoly of our public services, which has always managed its budgets impeccably. Why? We pay through all public services through this company. I'm talking waste management, energy, landlines, water. This is a very successful company and their secret was, yeah, it became a mixed company after a while, but it has always remained state-owned. Year after year, this company would transfer resources to the city council, to the mayor of Medellin specifically and this meant more availability of financial resources and funds to develop participatory activities plans and projects and this has been crucial and the foundation of the whole process that we've had the opportunity to carry out throughout the time plans are extraordinary don't get me wrong but plans that cannot become projects, plans that cannot be instrumentalized, are left to the realms of literature. Planning is a literary genre, and yet it shouldn't. It should lead to implementation. I studied literature. I love that stage of implementation. Yes, of course, in planning and participation, we always need to bear in mind that things need to be feasible and implemented later. That's what Medellin has done precisely. It's been in a constant permanent planning exercise at different scales and different levels, but everything has materialized in projects. We need to highlight that these have been the fruit of multi-sectorial participation efforts. That is why Medellin was able to intervene in a comprehensive manner. If you intervene in territory, I mean, I was talking before about our 
international visits. We want to create a library park, we hear. That's not as simple as hiring an architect. You need that prior participation exercise so that the whole territory is dreaming about it. You want the population to be craving this space, this library, and using it. Everything is put out of tender. All stakeholders get excited. There's co-creation. And the population can use these spaces as they dreamt they would. This is something that has defined Medellin a lot. This territorial understanding and analysis. It just makes all the sense in the world because I have worked in different departments of territorial matters, planning level, regional level, city level, national level. A mayor I worked with once said, let's invest in an inversely proportional manner. That was the logic of Medellin in every intervention in their territory. And that's what governance should be doing. We should be able to distribute development in an equitable manner through projects, plans and budgets because I insist planning can stay in the realms of literature if there is no implementation following. More than anything else, we saw the participation of 70 four sectors and 5,700 people for the strategic plan of Medellin. But in all of these exercises, we've seen sectors and different stakeholders, and they have always counted on budgets, public and private funds, and academic funds too. The academic world plays a fundamental role I have been involved in university for 30 years. I've also spent 30 years in the public space. And therefore, I have no identity problems when people oppose politics and academia. Academia has always been there. There is no opposition. It is a platform that supports the conceptual construction and technical construction of visions for the future and it systematizes all projects so that we can continue building on the foundations that are already there. I've shown you several projects so that you know that these are mere fiction. I can never resist the urge to showcase our case studies. The fruit that we have borne. We have received visits of people telling us that they want to hold a collaborative activity, for instance, to build 300 houses. This happened once. 300 houses in a flooded area. At the end of the participatory project, we counted 18 entities participating. They had built the 300 houses. They won the National Architecture Award, and these stakeholders came back to me to tell me that they had 5 million pesos left, $4,000. This was not a lot of money, but it was significant. It has been recognized for its high quality as a project, and these things can happen. There was even money left. These things can happen, but only if they are thoroughly planned, carefully planned and carried out in a participatory manner. That's when people start to view things differently. If you see a reduction of corruption, this is understandable because we all take ownership, belonging of the city. It's our money, our vision, our territory. A key sentence for me is, institutional and technical capacity building is fundamental. 
That's why academia goes hand in hand with public administrations. You are doing the same thing here. You are collaborating between UNED and the City Council of Madrid. We also need to develop citizen capacities for a more meaningful and effective and full participation. It requires training stakeholders involved. This is a process that is never-ending, as I was saying. That's the idea behind it. You need to train the trainers, as we like to say. We need to be increasingly critical. Many people say, well, participation has become a mere landscape. I can mention some examples of top-down participation. For instance, I'm in my neighborhood council and, for instance, we opposed uh, to the opening of a private park, defending public parks. We are involved in all participation mechanisms. But this participation has to do a lot with the trust I have on administrations. And we need to get people to have faith in the process, to gain capabilities for people to see a real transformation resulting from participation. Otherwise, it will never be successful. I'm sorry for interrupting. Marta, can I ask a question directly? Can I ask Beatriz something that has to do with the comment that Beatriz has just made? Yes. My question is, you're in a city like Medellin, extremely violent, with a fearful population. My question for you is, very straightforward. How did you manage the start of participation? How did you kickstart the process? How did you convince people to provide ideas in such a scary environment? How did you get people engaged in participatory projects? It's not easy if everybody's feeling that lack of trust, that fear. How did you manage to achieve this transformation of their mindset? Let me start by giving you the end of the story, as I usually do. We not only have a solid structure, but institutional platforms for participation. But this is a different time. Back then, we were very scared. We were terrified in that initial stage of not even fear. It was more panic. Panic to approach our window, panic to go outside, to, to be in the street. I can tell you that I belong to a traumatized generation. And something that is key and that I mentioned as a success, I mean, there's a beautiful book about this. I can't remember the name. At this age, I start forgetting things, but Mariana Mejia is a very important role model associated to the first strategy. Medellin, back then, was suffering bombs, mafia, victims every day. It was a true catastrophe. But the national government named and created the Presidential Council for Medellin and its metropolitan area. This woman led the council. I wanted to mention the fact that she was a woman because it wasn't by chance. She has been an ambassador of Colombia. She's been a chancellor, a minister, a candidate to president. This woman was the director of the agency encouraging cultural and cinematographic artistic studies and one of the factors that played a key role back then was the fact that she started with a team of architects and communication experts. She started reaching the neighborhoods with the small public space interventions that she became famous for. This team and herself didn't initially catch anyone's attention. These small interventions led to no resistance, so they were able to infiltrate these places with small artistic 
interventions this is a very resentful country with all due respect back then we would turn churches into football pitches what a different way to interact instead of using guns we started watching films together we replaced guns with cinemas with sports theaters and this had a very interesting effect we were talking about 30 40 small interventions transforming our city and then a very beautiful project called arriba mi barrio arriba mi barrio took place on friday and it lasted all afternoon and it showcased cultural events and pu small public space interventions and it shed light on the most excluded isolated societies that had basically no representation no presence for the state these populations had been instrumentalized and victimized by criminal groups who used them for their purposes and then the strategy was so successful we achieved a huge transformation even the host of arriba mi barrio became the mayor later on alfonso salazar he later wrote patron del mar one of his biggest values was his deep understanding of the territory and of course of the communities i know this because i've been a candidate for mayor and when i walked around medellin there were territories that i couldn't even imagine it was like the first time you imagine the sea when you when you haven't seen it you can not even imagine what it's like to be in front of it the first time that i reached the boundaries of medellin i had the same feeling of oh my god this is not a void in space a black hole this is not the edge of the world this is not hell these are instead beautiful municipalities full of delicious food and there's a saying in colombia that says the more dangerous the neighborhood the more delicious the empanadas this is the result of strategies and dialogue with culture as the main pillar of participation in a resignified public space in a city full of inequalities and gaps and the biggest next stage was for it not to be a sporadic intervention in small spaces instead this led to a structural axis with respective cross-sectional axes it was a whole system of interventions of comprehensive exercises and we were no longer talking about a football pitch here a library there we were talking about schools subways more structural public spaces what you call cultural acupuncture we love to use the spanish concepts if you ask me there must be many other ways of doing things but the seed that we planted back then was fundamental for the transformation of our city this was our, our secret sauce culture and public spaces and dialogue and sports integration all of these key words including inclusion they were all planted with the initial seed of participation thank you beatriz i don't want to exaggerate but i can feel the tears coming up it happens to me a lot and it's been 30 years that i've been working in this space i look out the window and i see the transformation of my city and it's so moving exactly and very exciting because you ask yourself how come people trusted the capacity of medellin to change to improve as you were saying it was so bad that it wouldn't appear in tourist guides so that people wouldn't visit medellin and now it's more touristy than bogota it's impressive 
I'm really looking forward to going to Medellin. My urban law book will be presented there. Of course, we hope that you'll feel at home here. I would be more than happy to welcome you all. We can talk more when we've got more time. My challenge today was to really present to you everything that we have done with real case studies. I represent what I believe in. And it would be wonderful if you could come here and see everything by yourselves. You can see the aftermath of the success of the Medellin model. Hello? Could I please interrupt? Yes, of course. First of all, I am extremely moved and very grateful for this workshop. Marta, grateful to you especially, as well as Beatriz. We went to the Tristan Arbaja Fair last year and we were very lucky to meet in Montevideo. I'm still pleasantly surprised by the Medellin process. It's really impressive. For me, it is key not only to guarantee participation but to create state policies. Plans are followed by implementation. As you were saying, implementation leads to the following plan. That's how things become a process instead of having to reinvent the wheel every single time. Every small step leads to the next one. That's my first takeaway. Secondly, I like to highlight how you used a public enterprise. I loved listening to this workshop. Thank you for your humility, your generosity. You were talking about plans and I'd like to mention something very important. People say to us, well, all your plans are contained in your regulations. Well, to a certain point, it's true. We have a whole portfolio of plans. Our plans are like a Russian doll. One contains the other, one leads to the other. But let me find a document for you. I can't find it right now. Anyway, it doesn't matter if these plans are not set in stone in our regulation because we have invented new instruments, the comprehensive urban interventions that are so renowned. You won't find them in our legislation. You won't find them in our regulations. We invented them to justify our comprehensive investment strategy in this territory. A territory that was so precarious. Comprehensive urban interventions were not only invented for Medellin, but then reinvented for the metropolitan area, Antioquia, different levels for municipal projects, for environment improvement plans, etc. Even more so in the metropolitan area. Inspired by Spain, we created metropolitan urban management plans and after three versions of for the metropolitan area each better than the one before the DG adopted the metropolitan strategic plan for territorial management an instrument that is definitely not binding but it's just to formalize the practices that had been carried out back then until that point and that got the whole country engaged. What I want to convey with this is that often it is more important and here I want to highlight that at the heart of everything we do you can find participation. We have been a very resilient society. We have understood that if we do not work together if we do not talk to one another, nobody thrives. It is almost a selfish act. There is a competitive model here that is extremely valuable. 
It happens in other cities of the country. You know, the second city of a country is always competing with the capital. The first city of a country is competing against the second largest. I will spend all my time, all my resources to shine more than anyone else. We are very selfish in Medellin in that regard. I am a director for planning. And if someone else has been in charge of two plants and five kilometers of road, I'll be in charge. I'll thrive to make sure I have three plants and six kilometers of road. That's what happens with us. The first city, I mean, we are the second city of the country. So we try to be better and smarter than anyone else. There's so much ahead of us. We have made many mistakes along the way in an attempt to improve, but we've also learned because we don't want to reinvent the wheel every single time. We want, we want to always work in a collaborative manner. This is a process of dialogue, of almost taking a peek at everything that everyone else is doing to learn from them. Behind every instrument for planning, funding and management that we have invented here, if it's in our legislation, it's fantastic, but if not, it's totally fine as well. I apologize for being so daring with my words, for being so blunt. Thank you for allowing me to share about my city. Thank you so, so much, Beatriz. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? I just wanted to congratulate you, Beatriz. I was working in Medellin in 1997 and 1998, and there was this metro cable culture that was so prevalent back then. It was amazing. We were talking about very difficult, very complex spaces. And yet, the users of these spaces took care of the subway. It was very impressive to see how people would take care of public goods. I decided to walk from the city center to Aranjuez, a dodgy area of town, and I could perceive that tension, so I loved the sentence that you said, if nobody talks to each other, nobody can thrive. Thank you very much for your intervention, Beatriz. Of course, the subway culture back then was huge. The factor that differentiated us was the metro. Because it has joined the two parts of the city that are separated by the river. The river is now an element that unites us instead of separating us, and it's all thanks to the metro that brought the outskirts close to the city center. Mobility is very difficult to maintain. It's difficult to keep it clean. But because it is so important, citizens take care of it because they value it. And also there's a fine if people throw litter in the metro. That's one of the crises that we're living nowadays. But we still have the hope to recover the success, the aftermath of the Medellin model to boost citizen capabilities. Well, Beatriz, I think we could spend hours talking to you, but as we say in Spain, We want to try to stick to time as much as possible. But definitely, this has been the first of many discussions. We are all looking forward to hearing more about your own personal experience, macro projects, everything. All of these things that we will leave for a future workshop. That's what we want from these workshops, for you to leave with that hunger to learn more about participatory projects. Thank you for your personal commitment. It is clear that you have lived this process firsthand. And your trajectory, your career, your life experiences, 
those are the main messages that we take away from this session. Again, Beatriz, it's been a pleasure, it's been an honor to have you here. I see my city differently today from a completely renewed perspective. Thank you very much. No, thank you for inviting me. I hope that we will have the chance to discuss in different occasions to share our concerns around the cities that we love. Thank you very, very much.